grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. I'm glad to see you folks who made it here this evening as we celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. I appreciate your willingness to put up with the safety things, with the masks and sitting a little bit apart. And for those of you that travel from Morning Sun and elsewhere, it's good to have you here. Uh, for those of you that, I don't know how many of you have come here multiple times before, but I hope that you'll take a moment and feel free to look around. Uh, not during my sermon. <laughs> but certainly afterwards, and just in case, important information, the bathrooms are that way. So, through the Fellowship Hall area. There are, the only announcement that I feel uh, we need to make at this time is that I will be on vacation. Uh, so, next, this coming Sunday, service will be virtual. The Presbytery has been good enough to actually create a service. Uh, with the specific idea of allowing pastors respite and getting churches an opportunity to be able to worship uh, together, as it were. They'll live stream it on Sunday morning, but if you don't want to do that specific time, then there is a link through the Facebook page of the Morning Sun Facebook page, uh, and... If you need a DVD because you don't get internet stuff, that's the man to talk to. He will get it to you. Um, and just as an uh, encouragement for you to watch the service, Bob actually did mo put together at least some of the music. How about three parts? Huh? One music and, and two readings. So Bob was participating in the leadership of the worship service. What time? Anytime online. On Sunday morning. But Sunday morning, if they were live. If you do it live, it'll be 9.30. 9.30 a.m. Uh, for the live stream. Well, actually, recorded stream. <laughs> well, it, it's going to stream. Yeah. If you clicked on the on the uh, Presbytery website, it would. Yeah. When I play. send it out to everybody, which I'll do on Friday, I will have all the links. So there you go. On Friday, he's going to send it out to everybody that has email. So, for instance, the Morning Sun, if you're on our email uh, newsletter list, you'll get the link. For those of you here in Minneapolis, that link is going to Angie, and she's supposed to forward it to all of you. So, uh, you should get it by Friday afternoon for Sunday. Uh, now, thank you for that question. That was an important one. Uh, are there any other things that we need to be aware of at this time. Well, if not, then uh, Pam, I don't know if if you played your prelude and or okay. Uh, so let's go to the Advent reading and the lighting of the Christmas candle. Uh, yeah, we've got some fairly hard to Advent hope moves us. Advent love leads us. Advent joy stirs us. Advent peace stills us. That we might affirm our King Jesus. It is time we set flame to this Advent affirmation by lighting the Christ candle. We believe that Jesus is the Son of God. He was born of the Virgin Mary in Bethlehem of Judea. He was the long-awaited Messiah whose coming was prophesied. The same Jesus lives today in our hearts. He deserves our highest loyalty and total commitment. In Jesus Christ, our hope is fulfilled. Our love is consummated, our joy is complete, and our peace is sealed. Rejoice! A Savior is born. A Savior is born indeed. Joy to the world.
Let us now join in the singing of the first verse of Joy to the World. You don't need to stand. Join us in singing the first verse of Joy to the World. to live with us. Let, Let us worship the Lord, the Christ. Let us sing our opening hymn number 250, O Little Town of Bethlehem. Things of life, 
and even in the pain and degradation of death. Glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. In the kindness and constancy of Jesus, we have seen the kindness and constancy of God. May our lives so catch and reflect the light of this revelation, that we may be changed into the same likeness ourselves, and thereby help to spread the shining of your light. Now let us praise God in song. So many tasks at Christmas, we forget who it is for. Imagine my surprise to find this note upon my door. If you look for me at Christmas, you won't need a special star. I'm no longer just in Bethlehem. You may not be aware of me amid the celebrations. You'll have to look beyond the stores and all the decorations. But if you take a moment from your list of things to do, and you listen to your heart, you'll find I'm waiting there for you. You're the one I want to be with. You're the reason that I came. You will find me in the stillness as I am whispering your name. And it was signed, Love Jesus. Great God, as we came at night when all was still, so enter our lives this night. Through your word in scripture, illumine our paths with the light of Christ's presence, that we may clearly see the way before us, the truth to speak, and the life to live for him, our Lord Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The first scripture reading I will be doing is Isaiah chapter 9, verses 2 to 7, which is on page 683 in your Pew Bible. After all the upheavals in our lives this year, we may feel more than usual that we have been walking in darkness, looking for the light to come, and that we need someone to end the violence and death and establish peace and righteousness. The promise of the Prince of Peace tells us that no matter how bad things seem, God is still working to bring about his kingdom. Isaiah 9, 2 through 7. 
The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. You have increased the nation, enlarged the nation, and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest, as men rejoice when dividing the plunder. For as in the day of Midian's defeat, you have shattered the yoke that burdens them, the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor. Every warrior's boot used in battle and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning, will be fuel for the fire. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Our second reading is from Luke chapter 2, verses 1 to 20, and is found on page 1014 in your pew Bible. The Christmas story, so familiar to many of us, tells something amazing if we pay close attention. The baby born in Bethlehem was not just a fulfillment of prophecy, not just God doing something miraculous in the lives of people like us, but God actually entering into our world as one of us. Luke 2, 1 through 20. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria, and everyone went to his own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Don't be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to men on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child, and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. Our third reading is Hebrews chapter 2, verses 9 through 18, and is on page 1185 in your pew Bibles. Even in a normal year, it is hard to escape an awareness that sooner or later each of us will face death though people find many ways to avoid thinking about it. This year we have been more aware of it than usual. The writer of Hebrews speaks of people being held in slavery by their fear of death, but he also tells how we have been freed from this slavery. Jesus destroyed its power, 
not by escaping death, but by submitting to it and then triumphing over it. Hebrews 2, 9 through 18. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, now crowned with glory and honor because he suffered death, so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. In bringing many sons to glory, it was fitting that God, for whom and through whom everything exists, should make the author of their salvation perfect through suffering. Both the one who makes men holy and those who are made holy are of the same family. So Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers. He says, I will declare your name to my brothers. In the presence of the congregation, I will sing your praises. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, he says, here I am and the children God has given me. Since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity, so that by his death he might destroy him who holds the power of death, that is, the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. For surely it is not angels he helps, but Abraham's descendants. For this reason, he had to be made like his brothers in every way, in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God, and that he might make atonement for the sins of the people. Because he himself suffered when he was tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We finish our Advent series, if you will, tonight as we ask one of the central questions uh, about Christmas, as we look at why and we begin to understand why the Incarnation. Now, frankly, some of it's going to go beyond us. We can enjoy the nativity scenes, the babe in the manger, the sheep, the ox, the wise men, and we can and will speak about Christ's humanity. But we also know that Christ was divine, and the mystery of the incarnation, as I've been wont to note in many different occasions that was very frustrating for me as a scientist was you get 100% human plus 100% God and it's only 100% Jesus <laughs> and understanding that mix is something that is a lifelong process but why the incarnation why do it this way? Well, the first one, I hate to say it it, it, it almost sounds like because. But the Father deemed it appropriate. From before the foundations of the world, it was determined that Christ would come, become one of us, suffer and die for our sins, that we might be cleansed and be raised again, so that as the liturgist noted, there is victory over death, and we can celebrate new life. Jesus came willingly, knowing exactly what must be done. This wasn't a case where the Father said, go, and he scuffed his feet, said, all right. No, he went willingly and joyfully. The time of his incarnation, living here on earth, was a time when he was and felt everything human. 
One of the things that he experienced, though, that some of us don't seem to, is joy. There were many times he was joyful. I know that we focus sometimes on when Jesus was angry, or when he, Jesus wept, when Jesus doubted at the Garden of Gethsemane, but there's a lot of times when Jesus had joy. He celebrated when the little children came to him. He gave his disciples nicknames. That were pretty crazy, showed a sense of humor. One of the favorite pictures that I have is of a woodcut that shows Jesus with a big wide open mouth laughing. There's no doubt Jesus laughed. He had a sense of humor. So he was like us in every way except for sin. In Hebrews chapter 2, that passage that we're going to look at tonight, as surprising as it may seem for Christmas Eve, it notes that the pioneer of our salvation was made perfect through suffering. And this does not imply that Jesus was anything other than perfectly moral. But it suggests a level of experience which we all go through, sufferings, being experienced voluntarily by the Divine Son. Given the vicarious nature of his sufferings, he thereby brings many sons into glory, or many children into glory. I've often said that life begins with pain, and even if you didn't suffer pain coming out, they're going to spank you on the bottom anyways. <laughs> Because they want to hear you cry. And so you grow through pain. And Christ experienced that with us. Christ sanctifies us, sets us apart for God by becoming one with us and making us one with Him. He drew us into the family of God, counting us as both brethren, brothers, and sons. Now, that sons is not being sexist. That sons is talking about inheritance. So we are folks that inherit the keys to the kingdom. We are folks that inherit the blessings of God because Christ is with us. As the one who was perhaps like Moses, yet greater than Moses, Jesus became one with his own people. And this was necessary in order to partake and procure our salvation. On Sunday, I spoke of the fact that Athanasius said something to the effect of, whatever wasn't human couldn't be saved by the divine because Jesus didn't relate to it. And whatever wasn't divine, divine couldn't be saved because it required that divinity for salvation. Nothing human could do it on its own. But also, and this is important, Jesus overcame death. The wages of sin is death, and Jesus overcomes it. And through that, we can overcome the fear of death. Death is swallowed up in victory, as it says in 1 Corinthians. Jesus destroys the one who has the power of death, that is the devil, and he breaks our bondage in a new exodus as we have liberation from sin. And he leads us into everlasting life. No angel could have accomplished this, so it was necessary for him to become a man. You might be asking yourself, why is he talking about the cross when it's Christmas? Why is he talking about death when we want to celebrate a new birth? Well, Jesus came for one purpose, and it's about the cross. And that birth is the beginning of what makes him able to save us on the cross. 
So the story of the birth is important. The story of the nativity that was read there in the passage from Luke and the angels visiting the shepherds and announcing that the king, the savior had come is critical. If he wasn't born, he couldn't die. But let us never forget as we celebrate his birth that it is his life that gives us life. It is his death and resurrection that gives us a reason to celebrate his birth. His birth was the ending of a promise that God had made to Israel. Now, they didn't realize it. And Advent is all about fulfilling the other part of the promise. As I noted in the beginning. So let's celebrate tonight that the first part of the promise was fulfilled. And because of that, we can celebrate and wait with joy for the second part. Whether viewed as a babe in a manger, as the man on the cross, as the risen Lord, or as the king upon the throne, Jesus is well able to identify with his people's personal problems and perplexities. And that is good news. Because he knows us. He understands us. And he loves us. Loves us with an everlasting love. That is deeper and wider than anything we can imagine. So celebrate tonight and tomorrow, the glory of the nativity, the glory of the birth, the wonder of the angels. It's a taste, just a taste of what God gave to us. It's a taste of what he's going to give to us in fullness soon. Wet your taste buds for the feast to come. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. If you would turn with me to number 262. We're going to sing Away in a Manger.
going to read from the passage of the first chapter of John. It's traditional in a lot of services of lessons and carols and in my experience within the church. While we do that, maybe some of the lights can be dimmed so that when we begin singing Silent Night and the person who's going to be our starter comes up and lights their light, we can get a feel for how the light of the gospel gets spread through the world. Here, chapter 1 from John. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him all things were made. Without Him nothing was made that has been made. In Him was life, and that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not overcome it. There came a man who was sent from God. His name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all men might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. True light that gives light to every man was coming into the world. And he was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was not his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children not of natural descent, nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. For the Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Let us turn to number 253. Can you like me? Two, five, three, silent night. Thank you.
to serve the Lord your God, ready to share the light of the gospel, a light that shines in the darkness and that cannot be overcome. Because the babe who was born in the manger is the same who rules on the throne. May you go in peace and may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship and power of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forever. Amen.